is Jake from JK Guitars and I've got a guitar here I'm going to finish so I thought I'd go through the finishing process. I get asked a lot about how I do my finishes and uh, the way I do it is super easy, fairly an inconvenience so I'll just go through with you um, so you can use it on your own instruments. Uh, so uh, a part of this is taken from Ken Parker's Arch Toppery uh, guitar making series um, which is where he uses an epoxy sealer coat before then applying oil finish. So I've been using oil finishes for back since I was at uni, 15 years now, um, as my main go-to. Uh, it's, it's dead easy, you don't need any spray equipment, you don't need um, a well-ventilated space, you can do it in your own house. Uh, it's really simple to apply, dries very quickly, and you can get a really nice soft satin sheen uh, finish to your instruments. Um, so what I have here is a 514 left-handed baritone guitar. So it's got a torrified Sitka Spruce sample, which is why it's slightly darker, and then black walnut for the back and sides, and a mahogany neck with ebony fingerboard. So I'm just going to go through the process of preparing the wood for finish, and then applying the first coats of the epoxy, and then oil finishes afterwards. So hopefully you'll be able to see how I go about doing it, uh, and how I get the results that I do. So first off, uh, we'll go through a list of the items you need before you start doing this to see you have everything ready. Sandpaper, paper towel, epoxy, tack rag, spreaders, scalpel, little brush, masking tape, oil finish, wax finish, a scale, rubber gloves, 4O wire wool, an old shirt, a mixing cup, an electric sander, and your mitts. So the first thing you want to do is figure out where your bridge will be positioned because you want to be able to mask that off uh, before you start applying finish so then it's easiest to clean up and glue on your bridge once the finishing is done. Uh, I always like to put the bridge on after the finish uh, as I find it's much harder to get an even finish uh, with the bridge on as it kind of builds up in the in the joint between the soundboard and the bridge it makes it very tricky to kind of clean up and uh, and do all of that. So it's much more simple if you uh, finish the whole guitar without the bridge but just mask off the area so then you can peel the masking tape away and it's got a good clean wood to wood finish. So whenever I make my bridges I have these two little uh, locating pins here. So what I've already done uh, is mark out where it needs to go based on the scale length plus a little bit for the intonation make sure it's centered to the neck and then I've drilled these pilot holes here so now I can sand the instrument and know without any needing to remeasure and mark again uh, where the bridge is going to go so now I can sand the whole guitar up and then before applying finish I'll then just mask off this area um, so I'll put some masking tape down put the bridge on trace around it and then just undercut to leave a little bit of a lip that needs to be cleaned up, but then the majority of the surface will be nice and clean. I'd recommend starting off at 180 grit sandpaper. I think any coarser than that, you'll run into more risk of leaving deeper scratches that are very hard to get out. And with most deep scratches, they don't really appear or show themselves that you've missed it until you've already put the finish on, so it's an absolute nightmare. So I'd start with 180, go over the whole surface, making sure it's even and clean. If you have any areas you might need to give additional attention, maybe there's been some grain pull out or a dent, um, just circle them off, mark them off, and then if there's any dents, you can steam them out with a soldering iron and a wet rag, and that can help um, raise, raise the dent out. And then the key areas I find trickiest, that you need to pay a bit more attention to, is in the join here, where the neck meets the body, as it's quite tricky to kind of get a sharp piece of sandpaper into that corner, but I'll try and show you how I go about it. Um, any areas where there's a large amount of end grain is always very tough to sand as well, so you have to spend some extra time on this area, which is usually the bottom of the heel, and then also the top of the headstock, should really be the only spots where there's any severe um, end grain visible. And then, of course, while you're sanding the neck, you want to keep the sanding as even as possible so you don't end up adding any kind of dips or divots to the instrument. At this point as well, it's really good to give a good feel of the whole neck um, in both hands in different positions so you can kind of identify if there's anything that 
needs to be worked on before you end up putting the finish on. So it's always best to kind of approach it at different stages and with different directions and then you'll be able to spot any little lumps and bumps that you can work out. Um, if you just stick to the plain position that it will be in, you might miss something. So it's always best to swap hands, do it upside down, anything like that, just to then help identify areas to work on. You can do the whole hand sanding process by hand using a block and rolls of sandpaper like this. Um, although I will be using a Merca sander, electric um, random orbital sander to do the initial sanding uh, and then there are certain areas which I deliberately then re-hand sand after that um, because some woods are particularly difficult to get the kind of spirals out that the Merca sander would leave even if you go through the grits so for example the ebony head veneer, basically anything ebony um, if you're not really careful these teeny tiny spirals will only show up once you get the finish on uh, so whenever I do an ebony head veneer, I would say initially do it with the orbital sander, but then afterwards hand sand it um, with the grain to make sure all those swirls are out and then basically go through the grits by hand on any large ebony surfaces. Um, always sand with the direction of the grain if you're doing it by hand. Um, the hardest thing ever is to get a, a cross or a diagonal score out of the woods. and always keep in mind how soft some materials are uh, so if you've got a cedar top that will sand very easily or a redwood top um, so you won't need to apply as much pressure as if you were sanding a thicker or an Indian rosewood surface that will require a bit more uh, more elbow grease so if you do have a random orbital sander and you're working on a cedar top don't spend too long doing it because you'll end up taking a lot more material out than you can expect. Um, so you'll end up having dips and, and or hollows and things. So just really just scuff the surface. You're only cleaning the top what, 0 0.01 uh, of a millimeter of the surface to, in order to get it all cleaned up again. As you can see, there's lots of grime and marks and different things from building the whole guitar. So you just want to make sure everything's all cleaned up and fresh. As you can tell, there's horrible weather outside, being Northern Ireland, so we'll try and fight the wind and the rain, but we should be grand. The best thing to do to start with is just do lightly pencil mark over the whole surface. And we'll do this every time we change grits to help us visually see where we've um, done the sanding correctly and where we need to apply more uh, attention. And again on the sides, just go across diagonally. You also want to be careful when sanding the edges, you don't want to roll over too much because they will knock away your bindings. Um, and it's also important as you get to the end to try and keep the same level the whole way across. So you're not doing a bit of this, because then you're going to miss the sanding of the edge. And you're not applying too much pressure that you're pushing it down, then you'll take too much off here. Um, this is where the pencil mark comes in to help give visual guides of the edges to see whether you've sanded them all correctly. Uh, I am starting with the Merca random orbital sander and I've got my 180 grit paper on the back there. When using a random orbital sander you don't have to sand like this with the grain because it's spinning in all the directions so what's good when trying to level a large flat surface is to go across the grain with the machine and that will help knock off any kind of ridges or high spots and then you can do a final pass with the grain like this and that will ensure you've got a nice flat even face for the wood. It's all looking quite clean. I can just see a few spots I want to give a bit more attention to. There's a bit of pencil mark here that didn't get rubbed off, which means that must be a little, little dip, a little hollow, so I'll work on that. I can see a few scratches left behind 
from either scraping the bindings or from the sanding belt of the thickness sander. So I'll come over and touch that as well. And I can still see a little bit more of uh, the shellac, which I put on um, around the perimeter of the guitar before cutting the binding channels. It's supposed to help kind of stiffen the material up and help stop it getting fluffy. So a little bit of shellac still left there. Everything else is looking quite clean. Now, one thing that's very tempting to do with a orbital sander like this is instead of holding it flat, you try and target a particular area by tipping it in to the wood and you're, you're kind of like just attacking that one spot. Try and avoid this at all costs uh, because all you're going to do is you're going to sand away whatever problem you're looking at but it's gonna just leave a big dip um, and then you'll never get, well, unless you sand a lot, you'll never get that dip out and then you'll see it in the reflection under the light as a bit of a nightmare. So as you might have seen, while I'm trying to attack certain areas, I'm not just focusing just on that area. I'm kind of spanning a whole surface just to remove one area so it's a more gradual attack. Um, so then even when you're feeling it now, it's all smooth and uniform there's no dips, no hollows, um, so just try your best to keep the machine flat. Don't apply too much pressure down on the machine. Um, allow it to kind of do its thing, let the sandpaper work itself. Um, so you should be able to see the head of this spinning very freely um, as you're working around. It's always good to have a good light source so you can see in the reflection if anything catches your eye or needs a bit more work. Now to do the sides, again, it's, it's a little bit trickier, but it's best to try and keep, obviously, the flat of the sander level with the sides. Um, if you roll over, then you're going to lose the thickness of the bindings, and that can be quite obvious when you're looking at it uh, as straight on. So you want to try and keep the look of your bindings very uniform in thickness. So if you're knocking the bindings as you're going around the sides, it's going to really show up. Again, you want to keep it flat, but you also want to be able to move um, level with the sides as well. You want to make sure you keep that curve. So try not to stay static on any one spot because you end up gonna you're gonna sand a flat, and then when you run your hands across it, you're gonna feel this this flat part of the uh, sides. So I usually work in little chunks. So I go from say the end to about the the low about, and I go low about to about here. Um, because you can't quite get the the electric sander in to so that tight curve. As soon as you do, you're going to then focus the corner into that curve and then you can end up causing scarring or kind of hard cuts into the waste. So don't get the sander into this area. You can do that by hand, it's no problem. And then I'll do this up about again. Don't get too close to your neck. Go to about there. And then you can kind of break into chunks, it's not too daunting then. Um, again, make sure you've got lots of pencil lines, and this will help you spot if the sides have any hollows or dips or wiggles. Um, and as soon as your pencil lines are gone, uh, you've got a nice flat side. If you do work away and you see areas where there's still pencil marks, don't again try and attack it directly, try and do the whole area evenly, so then there's nothing obvious that you've, you've really tried to attack. So it's coming out, coming out quite smoothly. Um, I flatten the ribs quite thoroughly before applying the binding, so there's hopefully not a whole lot of work to do here. But I can just see little areas where the pencil mark is still visible. And a little bit here. So again, I'm not attacking this area, because um, these are the low spots. You actually need to attack everything around it. So again, keep the pressure light, keep it moving very fast. Um, don't spend too long on any one area and you should find these go away in just a few more passes. Just give the side a feel. This side's got a lot of figure in it at the bottom here. Um, so what that means is the grain's popping in and out um, to give that kind of uh, wavy look. Well, that does mean that you're sanding uh, long grain where the grain is lying flat and then the darkest patches are short grain, so that the grain will be kind of standing more upright. 
Um, this means that the long grain sections will sand a little easier than the shorter grain sections of sections that are poking out. So for example, on this section, the lighter wood, which is the flat of the grain, uh, will sand a little easier than the darker lines of this figure. So again, it's another thing to keep an eye out for. This is why you don't want to spend too long in a certain area or apply too much pressure. You just want to keep it really quick. Um, you may find some of these figured woods areas that working with a block with sandpaper um, will give a slightly better um, finish, a bit more smoother finish, um, as the sponge, obviously, of the padding can kind of uh, attack the, those two densities of woods slightly differently. So if you are having trouble with figured woods and you're not getting that smooth finish you're looking for, uh, try it with a block and sandpaper, a flat block, and that should help you out there. Another thing to do is you can clean the, the pad just on some carpet, so just run it onto the carpet and that should knock off any kind of bits of dust that might get stuck on there. Now I'm happy with that, so I'll move on to the next section here, which is this little patch here. Um, the 180 grit is going to take the longest to do. Uh, that's because you're trying to get everything to a nice uniform flat after doing all the work you've done, uh, scraping the binding, fitting the neck, shaping the neck, etc. Um, so once you've put the time in with the 180 grit, the rest is easy. It's a, it's a dog because um, then you're just kind of polishing it rather than having to do any sort of heavy removal. So it's worth taking the time to really make sure everything's right when you're doing the 180 because um, everything past that will make everything much easier. So you get the sides good fill with your hands, you should have a nice smooth contour, there shouldn't be anything uh, poking out or, or wobbly um, as you're going along. Like I said, stop before you hit to the waist because otherwise the edge of the sandpaper will cut in as you're, as you're changing direction. Um, again, it's easy to do by hand. Okay, happy with that. So I'll just go on and basically continue this whole job around the sides and then I'll move on to the top and I'll catch up with you then. Okay, now we're moving on to the soundboard. Now, you need to be extra cautious on the soundboard uh, for a start. Uh, it's a lot softer than any other material you'll be working on, so it sands a lot quicker. Um, so you really only need to do as much passes as it takes to remove the pencil marks from the surface. Um, if you've accrued any dents or dings from resting the top on a bit of hard glue or a bit of fret wire even, um, steam them out now using a soldering iron and a wet rag. Um, steam it out as best you can because uh, otherwise if you don't do that then you're going to keep having that hole, that divot. Um, if you steam it out and there's still a bit of an impression then you just have to sand that area a little bit more thoroughly but again don't just attack that one area fan it out, feather the whole sanding process um, so you don't end up with, with big hollows in your top. We will be sanding up to about this area around the fingerboard and then sanding this right up close by hand and then we'll be sanding the inside of the rosette by hand as well as well as the end of the fingerboard and the edges of the fingerboard as well. And like I said, because we've got these pins to locate the bridge, we no longer need a center line or any other markings to help locate the bridge, so we can just remove everything by now. Um, again, going uh, widthways first, just to help knock off any kind of higher areas, and then clean up by sanding um, with the grain. That's only, of course, if you're using a rotary sander. If you're hand sanding, don't, don't go across the grain. Just go with the grain at all times. Feels good. Um, just keep an eye out for any pencil marks from the center line whenever you are joining the neck. Um, and also, these edges here are usually quite tricky to kind of hit because uh, it's such a small area, it's easy to kind of roll over. So, the little bits of the upper belt, um, just pay close attention to. As I can see, actually, in the light, I've actually missed this little bit here. So, I'll go back over there. But otherwise, just feel over it with your hand. 
see if there's any irregularities you need to accomplish or, or work on. And just make sure, usually when you're scraping the, the bottom areas here, um, the grain around the, the end of the binding here will kind of get pulled instead of shaved. Um, so just make sure there's nothing that looked kind of crushed or dragged. So just go over that area nicely as well. Again, try not to roll over the edges. Try and keep them crisp for the time being. We'll touch the edges of the bindings right at the end when we're doing the 320 grits. So again, look in the light, check the reflections to see whether anything catches your eye. That's all looking pretty good from here. So we haven't touched these edges yet. That's fine, we'll come back to that in a second. Uh, and then just round the sound hole, get a piece of 180 grit paper, and then just nice and quick because, uh, again, like with the kind of figured grain, you can have end grain here, which is much harder, and then you have long grain just here, which sounds very quickly. So the edges of the sound hole sound much quicker than the top and bottom of the sound hole. So you just want to be quick with some sharp sandpaper. You want to nice and clean and uniform. You don't want to spend too long on it because like I said, because these two areas are very soft, if you spend too long sanding, you'll end up making a kind of oval where you've removed material from the long grain of the soundboard much quicker um, and that will distort the, the, the circle of the rosette. So you just want to be nice and quick. And then just fill it with your finger, see if there's anything you need to give attention to. And that's that. So, uh, now these little edges by the fingerboard, you can get your nice clean piece of sandpaper and find a clean edge that hasn't been used yet. And just butt it up against it and then sand back and forth. What you got to watch out for is your fingernails because you don't realize how easy it is to drag a fingernail through a soundboard. Um, it will dent very easily at this stage. So make sure you keep your fingernail where you can keep an eye on it. No need to rush. You're just going with the grain until it's as smooth as the rest of the soundboard you've just done. Now you don't want to spend too long in this area because what can then happen is you can create a little divot uh, up to where it meets the fingerboard and then when you're looking at it from the side you'll be able to see that you remove too much material of the soundboard. You can see a little bit of soundboard underneath the fingerboard if you can see what I mean. So you don't want to attack this area too thoroughly. You want to do the bare minimum, clean it up. So now that side's been used, it's gone a bit darker in colour. I don't know if you can see that there. I don't think focus. Um, so when you're doing the next side, just pick a clean corner, like this one here, fresh paper. Um, fresh paper cuts faster, you need less effort to put into it, it'll do the job quicker. Um, and then you'll run less risk of sanding in irregularities. So then to keep it fresh and clean and do a quick job, um, it'll be much, much faster than trying to get the most out of some dirty piece of sandpaper. And then just the edge of the fingerboard here, find another clean corner. And then I'm just biting the bottom of it with my thumbnail to keep it pressed into the ebony fingerboard. And I'm just dragging it down nice and gently. So you just want to make sure there's an even look to the wood and that will show you that it's all got the same scratch pattern, which means it'll all take the finish the same way, which means it'll look all the same once the finish is on. One thing that helps clean the dust off is these little makeup brushes. Um, they usually come along with makeup, so if you've got a girlfriend or a mum or whatever else, uh, steal her brushes, because they're very good at getting into the nooks and crannies and just cleaning things away so you can have a better look. And then just clean off the end of the fingerboard and do the other side as well. 
So if you're finding your fingerboard, uh, your sandpaper is getting a little buildup of the material, if you can't wipe it off on the carpet, just roll the piece over, create a new sharp edge, and then you can get the most out of uh, your piece. It's always important as well to work in an environment that's kind of open. As you can see, I'm spinning these guitars around trying to see what I'm doing. And the last thing you want is to be hitting shelves or other guitars that are hanging up or you know anything like that because then you're going to add dents into your wood and there is nothing more frustrating than finishing 400 grit sandpaper level turning it around dinging off a door handle and sending your set back another half an hour trying to fix your little issue so you find different ways to kind of position things um, I've got a carpet base that's wrapped around the edge of the table so there's no risk of it banging onto the corner What I'm going to do now is just sand these wastes that we've left. If you fold the piece into three, I find it a little easier to use because then the grit from the edge is now biting into the back of the other piece and it holds it all together. If you just fold it in half, it can kind of slip around on you and be a bit tedious. Um, so you fold it into three, and then there's a lot more kind of there's less slip on the paper. And just go with the grain, have nice and quick movements. So I'm just going halfway, that's as far as I can reach before my knuckles hit the wood. And then I'll turn the guitar around and come at it the other direction as well. So let's spin around. Just give it a good feel, make sure it's all nice and smooth, and you have a good flow of a curve. If you have any kind of bits like a 50p, give them a bit more attention just to knock them out. Uh, I'm not applying a lot of downward pressure, I'm really just holding the paper where it needs to be and letting the speed of the cut um, clean off any high spots for me. If you come across any little glue spots while you're working, it's best to try and remove that with a tool before you use the sandpaper. Um, the glue is a lot harder than any of the wood it will be stuck to and then it will take a lot more sanding to get through. So while um, you may have removed the glue spot you're working on, you have removed a lot more of the material around it and then you create little humps and divots. So what I do is just get a nice sharp tool and just take off as much of the glue that you can see before then going back with the sandpaper, fold it over, pressing with your fingernails, and then clean it up from there. So find a nice fresh corner, pressing it with the back of your fingernails, and then butt it into that join, clean the whole surface off. So right, that's the whole body now sanded. Um, this is an ebony heel cap, like I mentioned about the head veneer and such. You're more likely to end up with the little swirls um, being much more visible on the ebony than anywhere else. So what I will do is just come back over by hand with the grain and just gently remove that little top surface. I do not want to put the finish on and see spirals everywhere because then I will cry. So the next thing to do is the neck. As I said before, if you're doing it by hand, just get the sandpaper around the palm of your hand and then work it back and forth. Be careful because you'll be going over the center part twice for every motion. Um, so if you do too much, a too high, a lower grit, um, you'll end up kind of creating a dip in the back of the middle of the neck. Um, so just make sure you try and apply the same pressure throughout the sanding um, in order to keep everything nice and straight and firm. So I will be sanding the back of this. So the technique for doing necks I find quite useful is to kind of roll with the shape of the neck. Um, you can also run up and down quite quickly as you're doing that. Um, again, you don't want to get too close to the ends as I've got here a volute so I'll sand to about there 
and this heel I'll sand to about here as well otherwise like I said you'll create grooves into these changing profiles and they'll be a lot more hard to work out so we're just going to do the main 80% of the neck and everything else we're going to do by hand So always double check, once you see that you've scuffed the surface so it all looks very uniform, just double check with your hands, make sure you're not missing anything. Um, so I could probably just shy down the edge of the ebony on this fingerboard, so I'll do that by hand with a bit of paper in a minute, just to clean that off. Um, as you can see, because I'm able to rest it on the table, hold it with one hand, I can move both the body and the sander at the same time to help me do the whole curve in one motion, keep everything nice and clean. Like I said, just feel it with both hands, feel it in different directions, and then you'll really be able to identify any parts you need to give more attention to. So now is the heel. The heel is always a tricky spot because it's all end grain and it takes a lot longer to sand this clean. Um, I would try and avoid using scrapers at the end of your sh heel shaping process because um, I feel it sometimes can kind of collapse the, the, the tubes of the end grain and then it takes ages and ages to sand out. Um, so try your best to use a sharp tool like a chisel um, or a knife and doing a lot of the final bits of the carving because um, then it makes this stage it kind of it kind of speeds up quite a bit so get a piece of sharp paper that bit there is clean enough and we just want to go in the direction of the neck um, normally you have to sand with the grain obviously when it comes to end grain there's not really a right way to go um, so as long as you keep it all in line should be more than enough to kind of get you going. This is the part of the guitar which is going to be felt the most compared to the rest of the instrument. So you want it to be as perfect as you can get it. And you can apply a bit more pressure on this section as well because the end grains is a lot harder. And I'm going to try and not let the paper touch the side of the guitar as I'm doing this. So you can do quite firm long pulls of the sandpaper and that'd be quite effective and then wherever the the neck meets the heel cap that usually takes a little bit more attention because all of a sudden you're changing densities of materials it's usually a hardwood that's um, for the heel cap so then it will sand a lot less easily than the neck you're using. Now my heels are asymmetrical, but then they've also got this kind of spine running down it. So I want to try and keep that nice and clean. Um, so I'll make sure when I am sanding, to keep it level with that kind of the angle. Um, and make sure I don't roll over onto this corner because it doesn't ruin that kind of sharpness I'm looking for. I want it to be nice and crisp. If you're doing, say, a stiletto heel, you'll have something similar to that, just down the middle of the neck. And then if the center of that line goes off one way or another, you can just sand a little bit more on the opposite side and bring that straight, bring it back straight. So once you think you're happy and you've got um, it evenly well, looking very even and all scuffed. Just keep giving it a good feel. <clears throat> Try and talk over the rain. Um, once you do one side of the heel, you can then do the other. And then make sure you keep any center reference lines you've got there um, lining up nice and straight. Okay, that's that done. And now um, these kind of walls here, I want to try and keep the the break of it, that angle, nice and clean and sharp as well, just along there. And again, this is just like sanding the edge of the side. Just want to get a nice clean edge of sandpaper. Let's roll that over. 
pinch it with the back of your fingernails and just spot it in if you were planning in advance you would clean this area off quite nicely um, just before you glue the neck on so just using a, a block with some sandpaper what I like to do is kind of drop the piece into the corner and then pull out of it I find that can be quite helpful as well if you get a bit stuck so now we need to sand where the headstock meets the neck um, this could be a little tricky I've got a volute here which is a bit of reinforcing material around the back of the neck um, if you haven't got one of these it should be a lot simpler it just blends the, the back of the headstock into the back of the neck and then blend the sides into the bottom of the headstock here it should be quite simple um, there's a little bit more curves involved with the, having a volute so we've just got to spend a little bit more time to make sure everything fits nicely um, so you get your piece of sandpaper that's folded into three pinch it uh, at either end and then use your index finger to poke into the middle and that will give you a good um, reinforced curved piece of sandpaper when you're sanding this area there's one uh, area which can be caused quite trouble can cause a bit of trouble um, basically the ebony is obviously very hard to sand as is the ebony head veneer but this patch in the middle where the nut is is just the bare wood uh, bare mahogany so you'll be sanding from a hard spot here hit an easy spot just where the nut is and then a hard spot again where the head veneer is so you could end up with a little dip just where the nut slot is so to avoid this keep your sandpaper nice and sharp apply very little downwards pressure and keep your motion very quick and then you should be able to avoid creating a, an indent where that nut is. It's also good to use the, the pad of your thumb um, so then the paper folds around it as you're going into the curve. That can be very useful as well. And then you should be able to see from the scratch marks if there's any surfaces you haven't touched, in which case they'll be a little bit lower than everything else. So then just keep moving around so you don't create any flats or hollows. And just keep sanding until those low spots have been removed. It may feel like you've been sanding for about two days by now, um, but like I said, the 180 is the hardest grit because you're trying to remove all your machining marks, your tool marks, um, any irregularities or any issues with the 180 and basically give yourself a very clean, uniform, even surface across the whole instrument and then when it comes to the other grits you'll fly by, it'll take, it'll take maybe a quarter of the time if that you're not then having to do any hard work you're just removing the scratches from the rougher grits because if you rush the 180 grit stage and then go 240 320 and then you spot oh, there's a there's a ding here or there's a bit of grain that's pulled out or whatever it will be it's really infuriating to then have to drop back down grits in order to remove the issue so it's always best to just spend the extra 20 30 minutes make sure the 180 section is done perfectly now with the back of the volute this edge here you can either keep it very crisp and clean and um, what I like to do is just knock it back just a little bit so there's an even kind of one millimeter wall just running along the back between these two points of the headstock and then over the volute and then back again so if you're doing this as long as you keep that edge consistent along the whole line it will look more deliberate and more classy as well if it kind of is thin one end and thick the other it can look a little bit rushed or like you weren't paying attention and then obviously that will give the impression to the player that you were rushed and you weren't paying attention so now we're very close to the end these edges here are pretty simple to kind of work out Keep your paper folded over, two fingers, you can use a block, you just want to try and keep the paper very flat, you don't want to round the edges over, I want to have the front and back edge here really square, and then 
be careful when it comes to the edge here. You don't want to roll that over. And now we can go back to using the electric sander if you have one. Um, so what I will do is just touch the back of the headstock here. Of course, not getting too close to the loop because then it changes the direction again. And then clean off the face, removing any tool marks, sanding marks, uh, pencil marks, that sort of thing. And then I'll hold it at 90 degrees and just polish off the end grain here as well. Because as I used a router to cut this, there's a little bit of burn mark from the ends from when you're routing quite slowly. So that will help clean it off. Now the trick with the end, obviously, is to try and hold the sander as 90 degrees as possible. Keep moving, don't sit anywhere for too long, and just allow the machine to do a lot of the work for you. So now that those machine marks are pretty much gone, I'm gonna take it out there. I can just clean off and make it more uniform with a quick hand sand. Just to keep this line here crisp and keep the other side of the head veneer crisp as well. As I mentioned before, just to remove any of those swirls before I forget about them um, and then find them once I put the finish on. Just sanding with the grain. Especially attention near the nut end, it's harder to apply pressure at that point. Um, so you can miss that area quite easily. So you just want to make sure the whole face has very even scratches that go with the grain. Oy. So that's it. Pat yourself on the back. You've now sanded the guitar to 180 grit. Um, that's the hardest part of this task actually out of the way now. Um, so the next task will be to then move up the grits. So I'm gonna go 240, 320, and then 400. Um, I'll be doing 400 by hand as I haven't got 400 for the sander. Um, so I'll just be going with the grain in, in kind of light, medium firm passes. Um, so yes, hopefully just give it all once over now, get the light out, have a look at it, all the details. Um, Make sure there's nothing that you need to give additional attention to with the 180 grit. Um, feel up the neck, feel around the nuts, feel where it blends into the headstock, feel as if you're going up to the higher frets. Use both hands in case one picks up and the other one doesn't. And then you should be in a pretty good position. So I'm going to go through and just sand up to 400 grit and then I'll catch back up with you and show you how to apply the epoxy sealer. Okay, so uh, the guitar has now been finished to 400 grit. It's got a lovely shine to it. All the figure of the top is coming through really nicely. All the medullary rays, everything's clean, everything's smooth and feels really nice. So now we're on to the next stages. Um, one thing you might find useful is actually if you wear a glove on whatever hand you're not sanding, um, sometimes you can find that the, the moisture from the sweat from your hand can actually raise the grain as you're working. So you can kind of go around and, and run into kind of little patches that have raised up. So if you wear a glove on one hand as you're using it, then you don't have to run any risk of um, getting any moisture from your hand uh, into the wood as you've just sanded it. Um, so now uh, we have to mask off the bridge before we start applying the finish. Um, you can finish the guitar without doing this, but then you're just gonna give yourself more work um, as you will need to remove a lot more finish from the surface of the guitar before you can stick the bridge on properly. Because you want a really nice clean um, wood to wood contact. Otherwise you might jeopardize the glue join and with 80 to 100 kilograms of string pull on this bridge you do not want to run any risk so I've just masked oversize around where the bridge will be and then using my pins and the holes I drilled before sanding 
to get it in the correct position. Lovely. And I'm just very, very lightly, because you can even score the top with the pencil, so don't apply any pressure. Just very lightly drag the pencil around. Cut about two or three mil inside this line. So we'll still have a little bit to remove um, once the guitar's been finished, but definitely a whole lot less. So I'm just gonna score in just to cut through the tape. Um, I think I forget to do this about half of the time. Um, and I only remember I'm supposed to do it and I smear epoxy over the soundboard. Um, so I always end up giving myself another 20 or 30 minutes of extra work just from basically getting carried away with the job. Don't put the tape down with too much pressure because you don't, the last thing you want to do is end up pulling up fibers. Um, you can get low mask masking tape, low tack masking tape, sorry, which has very little glue on it. That's usually the best thing to use. Um, but any old sort of masking tape will do just grand. So then what we'll do is get a tack rag. If you haven't got a tack, tack rag, then just a piece of cloth will do fine. You just want to try and remove as much of the surface dust as possible. If you are using a tack rag, try not to apply too much pressure, as what can happen is the, the kind of resiny glue that's on the tack rag can be pressed onto the top, um, which would be a bit of a bother. So it's just a light pressure just to pick up any loose dust. Like I said before, if you've got a little brush, that helps us kind of get into the crevices that seems to like to hold in there and not come back out again. We'll need some paper towel. This is just bounty or plenty. I don't know how old you are, what name you remember. But um, just standard paper towel. The uh, blue roll can be fine, but it's, it kind of breaks apart a little bit more easily. This stuff kind of holds together a lot better. Um, so we'll just make a little kind of bed to stop the carpet getting completely covered. So we'll be applying the epoxy, um, spreading it out with a spreader. These are for car body filling, but any old scraping tool will work. As long as it's not any too hard a corner, because the last thing you want to do is as you're dragging across to then drag a, a hard material across the surface. So like an old credit card will do. Um, some of these I find the corners are quite sharp so I will just trim off the corners just to stop them um, getting caught onto the surface. So it's a two part epoxy. I'm using Z epoxy finishing resin. Um, it's got a 30 minute open time, um, which is very good. That's all we need. If it's anything like a 10 minute epoxy or a five minute epoxy, don't use that. You'll have a horrible time um, as it sets rock solid while you're spreading it around. So we will be mixing up um, about seven grams of each, so make 14 grams in total. That should be enough to cover the whole body, the sides, and the soundboard. So the idea is that we'll cover it in a layer and that will permeate into the wood. Um, and then after about four or five minutes, that's about as saturated as the wood will be from the epoxy. And then we'll remove the excess, um, spread it around the different areas, and then wipe off as much as possible with the paper towels to not leave any kind of wet spots. One thing to keep in mind as well is when you're doing finishing, you want to make sure the um, humidity of the space you're in is at the level you want it to be for the guitar. Um, so normally between 45 and 50% humidity is what's recommended. So once the epoxy has been applied and the excess has been wiped off, then we'll leave it to dry overnight. And then what we'll be doing is scuff sanding it with 1000 grit. Because at that point you're not actually sanding the wood, you're actually sanding the epoxy surface that you've applied to it. Um, and that will give a really smooth, really uniform finish. Um, and then we can apply oil coats after that. Um, one thing to make sure, I was mixing up some epoxy before to make a laminate of something or another. And the two bottles look very similar. And I put one down 
turned around, picked up the other one, and glued up a product. And then I came back the next day and it was still completely soaking wet. And what I'd actually done is picked the same bottle up twice and I coated this wood in two layers of resin or two layers of hardener. Um, thankfully these two are very different colors, so I can't make that mistake. Just with a bit of binding or a stick. Just spend some time really mixing in together as thoroughly as possible in a disposable cup. So now when we're ready to pour the epoxy, it's been mixed for a good few minutes now. Um, it's got air bubbles in it, but that's not to worry about. You'll be pushing them out once you apply it. Um, so I'll be pouring about two thirds of this onto the back and a big splodge and then quite promptly I'll start spreading it around um, around the guitar. So we'll just pour it on. And then just start spreading it around the guitar. Again, I'm not applying a massive amount of pressure to the wood. Um, I'm not trying to remove it from the surface yet. I'm just trying to relocate it. Um, like I said, I don't want to run the risk of scoring the wood with the spreader. So it's good to work from the inside to the edge because then you're not catching all the excess on the edge of the guitar and then spilling it down the sides. So work from the inside out, come to the edge and then work back into the middle. Go in lots of different directions to try and help push it into the pores. start to see the colors come out of the material. Now whenever I make guitars I always like to have the heel cap flush with the back and um, for one reason I like the look of it I think it looks quite clean um, and secondly it makes everything else quite easy so sanding is much easier when it's not down a step. Uh, finishing is now easier as well because I can just like I said just spread clean over. Um, so sometimes you're allowed to do things that make things easy for you. And if they happen to look nice, then it's all the better. So I'm just looking in the light to see if there's any spots that look a little dry or as if the wood's drawn in the epoxy already. I just want everything to have an even film across it. Because then we just need to leave it in that state just a few minutes before removing the excess. Right, so now we'll just move to the sides. So then we can start, I'll be starting to drag the excess gently and then using that in the next section. Just make sure the whole thing's coated. So, there we go. so, depending on how porous the material is, it doesn't take a whole lot of epoxy to really go a long way. Um, like this was, I think it only came to 12 grams I mixed up, and there's still plenty in the cup. And when you get to the joint, like the neck here, just use um, the spreader with some finish on the end and just touch against the neck and kind of spread it in. And then that will help you get right into that, that crevice. There we go. And then spread it away. And then just push it with the spreader both directions just to really help force it into the pores of the wood. So that's the back and sides and ends all with a coating on 
Just double check, especially at the end, it's harder to see while you're working around. Just make sure everything's got um, enough epoxy on it. So now we can move over to the, mm, uh, the top. So we've still got some epoxy left in the bottle. Don't worry about it sticking to the paper towel as we'll be using that to remove the excess anyway, uh, a little bit. So there's still a good bit left in here, about a quarter, a third of what we made up. Just scoop it all out. Just nice and gentle, don't apply too much pressure to the squeegee, you're not pushing it into the soundboard. We're just moving this epoxy honey around the top. And then as it gets stuck to the spreader, just pick it up, move it around to different areas. Moving from the inside to the outside. Then just here where it meets the fingerboard, just as we did at the neck, just touch into it, press it down, and then spread it out. Now when it comes to inside the sound hole, we'll just put some on our finger and run it around just so we can get a bit of a coating. And don't forget the bit of sound hole just underneath the fingerboard. Also want to get the edge of the fingerboard, so I'll just pick up some excess from over here, this much, and then just really lightly. You don't need a whole lot here, because when you come to wipe off the excess, you'll be kind of spreading it in that process as well. There we go, and then the end of the fingerboard. So now we'll start removing the excess. Again, real light pressure. I'm not trying to clean every drop off this. I'm just trying to get the heavy excess off so it's easier to wipe. So right, we'll go back to the back and then some firm pressure. It's now getting a little bit sticky. Start to get a little bit of elbow grease. You can always work these one panel at a time if you like. Um, so just do the back and then wipe it dry, and then just do the sides and wipe it dry, etc. Um, I think it's just good. I've done this a few times before, so I'm more comfortable with how fast I need to work, and then what sort of look I need to get to um, at this stage. So just use the light to look for any very shiny wet spots. Because we removed a lot of the material, well a lot of the excess to apply to the sides, there's not too much to get on with here. As you can see, there's not a whole lot coming off on the tissue. Now, if you find that the tissue leaves little bits of fluff um, as you're going, don't worry about it right now. Um, because when we do the quick flat sanding, um, after this is dried, that will take out any of the little fibers that have been left behind or any dust that kind of sits on it as it's drying. This is sort of the stage we're looking to get it to. See if I can try and show that on the camera there. So it's got a sheen, but there's no big wet shiny spots. And it's very even. That's a good place to be. The more wet spots there are, the harder it is to sand once it's dry. Oh, now it's really starting to grab me. So I need to just hurry up with this. When you're trying to clean out the corner, 
just tuck it in, try not to use a fingernail, because then you can drag it across the wood as you're kind of wiping against the grain. So you use the tissue paper to form a kind of corner. That will help you get it into those corners. So what you don't want is any large collections, because then they'll be rock solid and it'll be very, very difficult to um, sand flat with everything else. Not impossible, but just a lot harder than you'd like it to be. Then once you've got a majority of it off, just use a nearly a pretty dry, um, fresh towel. And just go around the whole perimeter and each of the surfaces that you've done. Just to pick up anything that could be left behind. Here's what we've gotten to. So you can have an idea of the kind of shimmer we're looking for. So this is 400 grit standard two, and then that 30 minute epoxy. And like I said, depending on how well this all comes out, if you're a rush for time or it's just your first guitar, or whatever, you might be able to just get away with this as a finish. Very low build, very light, and should add a little bit more stiffness to the materials, especially the soundboard. It's not going to make it bulletproof, but it will definitely help be a little bit more wear resistant. Um, so I'm going to make a fresh cup up, as that's been sitting for now. That's going to set, or at least go beyond um, use. Keep the cup with the old stuff in, and then as soon as that's rock solid, it's a really good indication that everything else is dry as well. Um, so I usually put that to the side, I usually write um, what guitar number it is and then when I come to it the next day, if for, for whatever reason maybe I've mixed something wrong or haven't done something right, then that pot will tell me. So if I come back and it's still a bit gummy, I'll know I've made some horrible mistake where I've misweighed the resin to the hardener for example. Um, but if I come back and it's brittle and hard, then everything worked out just fine. I can carry on with the finishing jobs. Don't need a whole lot to start with. Just pick a side, spread it out as much as you can with a stick, and try and keep it out of the nut slot, just because then you'll give yourself more work afterwards. And no one wants more work. So then just start relocating it to the edges and then the end now I'd say leave the end a little bit heavier for the time being because that's going to be the thirstiest uh, part of the wood it's all end grain so that will drink up everything you give it and then the back of the headstock Again, with the kind of curvy bits, you'll just have to use a finger and just spread it in places where your flat squeaky can't get to. Now, for the neck itself, this is where it gets a little bit more fiddly. So, start off by applying it to the curved areas of the back of the, the headstock and the volute. Apply it down the center of the neck. So I'd use the back of my hand to pick up the guitar by the fretboard because my fingers are probably going to be sticky. And then just working the finish onto the neck along the length of it. And just roll over the edges of the fingerboard. Now you don't want to come up too much because then you could end up spreading heaps of epoxy all over your fretboard. So if you want, you can just run with your finger down the fingerboard edge and then save the squeegee for the mahogany section. I'll do this a little bit better here. Use your finger, 
pull down the ebony, make sure it's all covered. Now start trying to remove some of the excess and then just relocate it down here. So wipe your squeegee off onto the heel, near the heel, and then you can start spreading it with your finger. Now where it meets the body and the sides, don't worry about getting it onto the sides, you can just wipe it off again. It doesn't matter that it will get a second coat. So. For the internal edges, like we did with the sides, what I'm doing here is just applying some epoxy to the edge of the scraper. Again, I'm not really touching it with my fingers, I'm going to loop a finger into the sound hole and move it. And then just press down and pull it towards you. Here's the whole neck covered and very, very little on the fingerboard, that's nice. So I'm just gonna go around now and double check, make sure everything's got a layer on it at least. Anything that looks like it's dried up, that's where it's been pulled in more, so just put a little bit more on for a little while. Um, and then we've got a few minutes before we need to um, start removing the excess. Okay, so now we've got the neck covered. Put that back down. There we go. And then get some more paper towel and start removing the excess. And then just check as well where the fingerboard goes onto the soundboard. There could have been some that's crept over, so just go over the whole kind of area. So now just to hold the uh, instrument paper towel and I'm just wiping off the edge of the fingerboard. So there we have it. So the guitar now has an epoxy finish, well epoxy sealer coat and then once that's dry we move on to the next stage. Clean this up and come back to it tomorrow. Okay, so the guitar has been left to dry overnight now. Take it down. Um, and then you just want to double check your mixing pots. Um, the epoxy should be really brittle and crack. Um, if it doesn't crack, if it kind of bends and is more malleable, it either means you need to leave it longer to dry. Um, and then if it still doesn't cure after another period of time, then it might mean that you've gotten your mix wrong. So then you will just have to maybe sand back and reapply. Um, so both of these are breaking and cracking. That means everything's in the right way. So um, what we do now, you can kind of probably feel there's little bits of fluff or dust or debris kind of stuck onto the surface. So what we're gonna do is just clean that back. So you just wanna get your thousand grit sandpaper, make a little square, fold it to three. Um, you can use this as a wet and dry paper, but for the reason I'm not going to apply water to this because if, as this layer is so thin, if I were to sand through it with a wet mixture, like a wet slurry, um, then the water will be drawn into the wood and then you can either have a discoloration or you can end up causing yourself a lot of bother, the wood would raise and that sort of thing. Um, so we can do this task uh, dry because it's such a small amount we're actually doing. Um, so basically you just want to sand with the grain, light pressure on the pad. And then every now and then, as you collect the dust, just wipe it onto a tissue or a surface just to try and clean off the excess. Um, and then if you get any large buildup um, of pieces of the dust on the, on the piece of paper, just change it around for a fresh piece. So just make sure you go all the way to the edge. Clean off the paper. I've started to collect some kind of kernels here, so I'm just going to turn the paper around. And just really light little passes. We're not sanding the wood anymore, so we don't need to worry about having to go through the grits from 400, 600, 800. Um, 
because we're just sanding the surface of the epoxy um, it doesn't matter that we're kind of jumping straight to a thousand because all we're doing was knocking off any kind of texture that's left behind from wiping off the excess of the epoxy so already i can feel this side is really nice and smooth and then this side has a bit more kind of grit to it a bit more um, coarseness to it so just keep working away until the whole surface is even as you can see it doesn't seem to take very long just to kind of flatten the surface off just make sure your paper's clean keep checking so be careful around the edges I wouldn't even bother uh, touching that with the paper just yet I save it right to the end and just do the light as it passes use the light to check just to see whether there's any areas that haven't got the same kind of scratch pattern I always find the edges you just have to touch up as well because you're kind of more prone to lift your hand off um, as you're coming to the end of the guitar and of course Sam with the grain you don't want to get any um, horizontal scratches at this point then just wipe off all the excess dust and powder with a tissue or a tack rag so that looks just fine so hopefully you can kind of see what we're looking for here so we're not sanding it until um, the pores are sanded through as well like you would be doing if you were grain filling this isn't a grain filling finish um, you can apply it thicker to do that but we haven't done that here um, so all we're doing is making the, the flat of the surface very even and then that should be really easy to apply the oil finish on top of so that only took a few minutes took about five minutes um, so don't have to put too much time into this area um, you will go through sandpaper um, so this now has a good few kind of spots and uh, collections on it that piece of sandpaper is what 20p so it's worth just going through it instead of trying to use that over and over and over again because then you'll just start dragging dragging through the through the finish now if you come across any little shiny spots i've got one here must be a little fingerprint i must have pressed on um, just start with that but just try and only attack that little spot obviously that part needs a little bit more sanding in order to flush it all out what you don't want to do is sand everything around it and then leave that proud um, if it's very proud you can always try and scrape it with a, a, a scalpel blade but I'm thinking I'll be able to get it here again with the size you like we were doing with the main sanding you break it down into sections and it's easier then to kind of tackle And then when you come to the inside corners, just the same way as we did when doing the main sanding, just fold over an edge, you have a nice clean corner, and then just kind of pull out of it. Now moving on to the soundboard, again, it's just the same process really. Go with the grain, use a sharp piece of sandpaper, light pressure, and just move quickly as you're going. So you can see, body's now done, and it's given it a lovely flat but shiny sheen and honestly if you wanted I'd say it's your first guitar or it's for yourself or whatever I think you probably get away with just putting a thin layer of wax on here buffing it up and calling it a day really because um, this does give a kind of nice very light very clean finish anyway um, 
partial to it anyway. And now we'll move on to the neck. This is just a little bit more fiddly because you've got to do a few more curves in the nooks and crannies around the headstock. Just be very careful with all the corners and edges because if you push too much pressure, you'll easily cut through um, the corners and then reveal the bare wood, which will look lighter in color. So you want to just avoid that. But it's not taking a lot. You just want to scuff the surface, really. This is obviously the bit that people are going to see the most, so you just want to make sure you do a good job here. Now just for the back of the neck, get a nice flat clean piece. I start with just stroking it down the edges of the fingerboard. And then just quite broadly curving with your fingers. Make sure you touch that transition point between the fingerboard over the soundboard and the fingerboard over the neck. It's usually that kind of little bit at the 14th fret or 12th fret if you're making that. Um, you can kind of get a build up because you're more focusing on this section and then this section and they don't marry up. So just make sure that you put a few seconds of attention just to clean that all over to make it nice and continuous. So the last thing to do is just touch the very edges of the binding. Um, fresh piece, just go around once. And that's all it will take to clean those off. That is the um, post epoxy fill prep. So now we'll be ready to move on to uh, doing the oil finish. But your guitar should be looking pretty good by now actually. If Followed all the steps and everything's gone okay. If there are any spots where you have rubbed through and you see the bare wood, all you need to do is reapply um, a small portion of epoxy into that area. So say for example, I've sanded through here, I can see the bare wood. All I do is um, just continue the, the, whole, the whole sanding process up until that point, um, just to see if anything else happens while you're, while you're doing it. Mix up a small amount of epoxy, apply it to this area, leave it to kind of soak in as long as you left the rest of it in the first step. Um, if you take it off too quickly, it won't have permeated as much and you might end up with different colors of the woods. Um, so leave it to soak in four, five, six minutes um, and then wipe it off as firmly as you can with a paper towel like we did before and then come back tomorrow and then just scuff back the surface. Um, so the way I like to set my table up when I'm doing an oil finish, make sure it's nice and clean of all the debris. Get your blue roll, roll it off the edge of the table, and then that could be where your guitar body rests onto the paper towel. Then as you come to um, remove the excess by wiping it off, you can then take from this chain um, and then clean it off. And then when the, when the rag becomes saturated, just pull on, that will unroll and you can keep getting fresh material there. But I'll kind of show you as I'm going along. So the oil I'll be using is called Osmo PolyX Oil High Solid Clear Glossy. Um, the reason I use the glossy version is because you can always matte your gloss finish with wire wool. So you can make a gloss finish satin, but if you bought satin finish, you couldn't make it glossy, you can't go up. Um, so I like to just start with glossy and then if I need to make it more satin, I can. It's easy that way. So make sure your mixture is fully mixed in. Um, give it a good stir. And then get two pieces of paper towel and then fold them into a little parcel. And that's what we'll be using to apply the oil and spread it around. Um, so you can go like kind of liberally. You don't have to be too cautious about how much you put on. Um, normally if you were applying the oil without the epoxy sealer, it will permeate the wood, it will soak into the wood. Um, and then you'll find some areas where there's end grain, for example, will soak in more than if it was a long grain. So then you have to keep going back and touching up and making sure that everything's got the same sort of coverage. But because we've put the sealer coat on, it should sit very evenly across the whole surface of the material, um, no matter whether it's end grain or long grain. 
Um, so that's one of the benefits of using the sealer. And then just start spodging it on. It's just spread it out evenly in little circles. If it runs over the edge, that's not a problem. This stuff takes a good while to dry, so you haven't got to run the risk of leaving drips and stuff. Make sure the whole area is coated and nice and wet. Don't worry if bits of your paper towel come off as you're working, it's not a problem. Um, we can just pick them up later on. So that's it, this is the sort of state it should be looking in. So quite wet, there's still a good thick layer on it. Um, and then we'll come to wipe off the excess once we've got the rest of the body covered. So then I will move on to the side of the guitar. Again, we'll keep the paper underneath the body. And then at this point we can just start dipping into the tin. Make sure we get a good amount on. As you can see, it's not taking a lot of time to apply it. You just want to get it on basically. In the corner of the neck here, just use the corner of the paper towel and smush it in. It doesn't matter if it pulls in here at the minute, we'll be coming to wipe off the excess in just a minute. So you can see I've kind of coated the edge of the neck as well, that's no problem. So. And then we'll put the wet side, you can put it down on the paper towel. So for the end of that, it should be looking pretty cool by now. You see the grain of the walnut coming through nicely. And then put down on the paper towel again. We'll use a neck support to help keep it all off the table. And then we'll go to apply to the top. And then don't forget to do the inside of the sound hole and that little edge of the fingerboard. And just, again, find a corner of your piece of paper and just butt it up to the groove and just roll it down. You don't want it to be too saturated when you do this bit, because otherwise each of the frets will catch a little bit and pull up. Um, so you don't need to go too heavy just here. At this point, I would move on to um, drying off the surfaces, removing the excess, before then going on to the headstock. And then once it's hanging, I'll do the neck. So we'll go down, we'll pull a paper towel. And then with the flat of your hand, just start pulling the excess off the surface with the grain and then make sure you keep going until you don't see any shiny or wet spots in the corner again just fold it over apply gentle pressure with your finger watch out for your fingernails so you don't drag them and just pull that through and that should be enough to get any heavy spillover from that corner. Now let's get another piece. So you see how this has got oil on already from where it's been sitting on it. That's not too big of an issue. Um, there's still plenty of dry paper to be able to pick up all the excess from the body. And then don't forget to get the inside of the rosette and the end of the fingerboard. If you get any on the fingerboard, just wipe it away off the edge instead of into it. So 
again. You can just go around the body with a near dry piece just to make sure you haven't pushed anything over the edge or left a wet fingerprint somewhere. And then we can move on with the neck. So we'll just do the heel here. If you get some back on the sides, that's no problem. You can even just do this while you're doing the sides. You know, go half a uh, quarter way up the neck and then wipe that whole section down in one go. But, so I just do the sides first and the end. And then just around the first fret here. Again, if it goes down into the machine head holes, that's not a problem. Just make sure you run a piece of dry tissue in just to clean out any big drips. Otherwise, they'll run down the face of the headstock as it's hanging and drying. There we go. That's all coated. And then back to drying it off. Now if you do leave any wet spots and you find them once the surface has dried, you just have to kind of knock them back with some 40 wire wool and they'll be able to apply the next coat. It's better to get rid of the shiny spots before doing a second coat, otherwise you'll kind of end up adding to them. And then it's a harder task at the end. And then just get yourself a nice fresh dry piece go over the whole area including the nut slot make sure you clean that out as well otherwise you could end up having any excess run down the neck and then like I said just make a little poke and then clean out the machine head holes of any big drips so now we've got that whole body done we'll just get our hanger and this is where we can do the rest of the neck so if you want to get a dry piece of paper and then use it to grab the guitar and then just give the whole neck a good coating um, but basically that's that's the whole process um, and then you can repeat this between say five, ten, a dozen times, whatever you want to or be comfortable with. Um, so that's what I'll be doing for the next few days. You can get about two coats on a day, depending on your weather conditions and how fresh your oil is. Um, this is brand new, so I know I can get two coats a day at least. Um, if it's been open for a long while and it starts to get a bit more gummy, it's more likely that you'll need to do one coat a day. Um, if you try and put two coats on too quickly and then as you're dry rubbing it off you'll end up having a lot more grab as the first coat you applied still hasn't quite dried yet um, it'll just make things harder for you so just be patient um, if you have got old oil brand new stuff like I said once in the morning once in the evening um, you can do that for two or three days and you should have yourself a very nice looking guitar okay so we're back and it's been about a week and I have gone um, seven coats of oil on this guitar now so as you can see it's got a real nice shine to it and it's all nice and even so if I were doing uh, my checks before doing the next coat I would look out for any particular shiny spots which might be like a thumbprint or a palm print um, or anything that's kind of run over the edge and I would just knock it back with some 4-0 wire wool just the matted off before applying the next coat and um, just to try and stop the fact that if something's a shiny spot and then you put three or four layers on top it might be a lot harder to get out so just as soon as it's dry and as soon as you spotted it just knock it back and then apply the next coat and in most cases if you've, if you've applied it carefully and you're happy with it as it is you could leave this as it is now um, and then apply uh, a wax coat over the top like I'll show you in a second and that'd be that what I like to do is just mat it back just a little bit bring it back to like a satin sheen um, which is why it's always good to go for a gloss finish and then you can satin it um, but if you have a satin finish you can't buff that to gloss it doesn't really work the same way um, it's always work with the grain it's not a time to go around the circles or go across the grain you end up with little fine scratches that are you know, a nightmare um, so you've got a big ball of 4-0 grade wire wool that's the finest stuff you can get um, if you use the coarser stuff 
you're going to have a, a lot of scratches as well. So just the fine stuff. Get a big ball of it, and even just the weight of your hand, just pull it back and forth. And this will help take off any little nibs that have been left behind. And any kind of areas that might be a little bit shinier than others will just be just be matted back. Keep an eye out for any spots where you would have wiped with the, the rag as you were cleaning up. Sometimes you can get, especially if you're doing the rim, you can see these little lines uh, a little bit shinier just going around the around the perimeter of the guitar. Now it shouldn't take too long. What usually happens is you do everywhere a bit rough and then you spot an area that you've actually done properly and you go, oh okay, I can see that this is exactly what I'm looking for and then you bring everything else to that same level. And don't apply too much pressure because <clears throat> you're not trying to remove the finish, you're just trying to give it a uniform scratch pattern. These little areas on the end of the upper belt, they're usually a little harder to hit, so just give them a bit more attention. And at the ends, like you see here, I'm just doing light passes over the ends, because again, they usually seem to be a little trickier to catch. So I just knock off any loose filings. As you can see, I've put down a fluffy mat over my carpeted area. Um, no matter how careful you are, your carpet or table covering will always pick up little bits of glue or solder if you're using soldering irons and stuff. Um, just have an extra protector um, when you're doing the final steps so you don't roll it over and drag it across something hard um, and ruin all the hard work you put into it. So, there's an idea of what it looks like now. So you still have the open pores, it's now got a really soft feel to it and there's still some reflectivity as well. Um, so when I hold your hands to it you can see the reflection of your hands. So it's really nice, really nice finish. Just light pressure, moving with the grain, try and attack everywhere evenly. Again, the temptation would be to get a real hard edge and then wipe across the neck like that, but then you'll end up having scratch patterns um, 90 degrees to the side. So just take your time. I'd recommend wearing a mask as well because there's all these little fibers flying off. But as I'm talking to you, I'll just try not to suck too much of this in. What you would normally find a shiny spot is this connection between the uh, fingerboard over the neck and the fingerboard over the body. Um, I can see I've got a little shiny spot, it's just where you're trying to dry it off and it ends up kind of not hitting that spot. So just apply a little bit more pressure to the wall. Just a few light passes until that goes away. I go on to the heel and um, because it's always a bit tricky with the heel it's all end grain so it's hard to figure out what direction to go to um, I would just wipe down the neck and then fall off the heel like that um, be careful not to then drag the edge of the fibers on the side so I just put one finger at the bottom of where your uh, wire wall is and that way your finger will run against the side and not the wire wall but again you don't need a whole lot of pressure Better to do a dozen light passes instead of two heavy ones. You have more control over it then. Lovely. So just get your tack rag. So that only took about 15 minutes to get the finished satin. Um, as you can see here, still got a nice reflection to it. And now we'll just apply a coat of wax and this will help um, increase the kind of moisture barrier that it will have. So anything, you know, sweat or beer will just bead up and fall off. Um, and it'll also just bring back a little bit more sheen. Um, and then this can be touched up throughout the year, um, even with just furniture polish. 
um, as you go. So I'm using uh, Colron Refined Finishing Wax uh, in clear, so you can either get clear or natural, that'll be the best, um, as I don't add any colours to the finish. Um, don't go for Jacoby and Oak or something because the whole thing will turn brown, uh, so we don't want that. Yeah, so you don't need to add too much, I've just got a little rag here, pack it on, and then you work on in little circles, make sure it's completely covering the surface. You don't need a huge amount, you only need to really leave a film, and it's best to kind of work a little quickly at this stage, because what I can find is if you leave it on in this state a little too long, it can be a lot trickier to kind of buff out. So it's got an old t-shirt, all folded up in a ball, and just with some quick motion. Just removing any excess uh, wax from the surface. So this is pretty much the same process for the whole guitar, just apply on a film, rub it in every which direction, just to make sure you get an even coating, little figures of eight, make sure you get the edges of the bindings as well, and then just buff it out. When your clock gets too loaded with the wax, and then it's visible there, just move around to a cleaner patch, as long as it's got no um, anything hard on it, any grit. Make sure your cloth is clean. So there we go. Nice shiny back. It's got a good reflectivity to it. Um, when you're looking at it at steep angles, anyway. And then it's just got that nice kind of old furniture feel which is really, really satisfying and um, really tactile, especially for the player. So there we go. I'll just continue with the rest of this. It's best just to do this in little sections. Um, like I said, it can kind of dry and be a little bit tougher to buff up. Um, so just do one side and then the other side, the back by itself, the front by itself, headstock area by itself and then the neck by itself and then you should find it a lot more easy. So there we have it. The guitar's now got a lovely fresh coat of wax on it. And it's a pretty quick process. That only took about 40 minutes from start to finish. Um, and now it's got this lovely sheen to it, it's got a lovely feel to it. And hopefully, as I've explained it, it's a very easy and quick finishing process you don't need any spray equipment you don't need any extracting equipment um, everything is quite you know fume friendly um, especially the oil finish uh, so as long as you do the correct prep work on the wood make sure you're sanding with the grain make sure you clean out the pores properly and um, with a tack rag or with an air compressor um, and as long as you address any issues as you see them like I said any kind of shiny spots, knock them back before applying the next coat. Um, once you've got the finish down for the first time, if there's any irregularities in the wood, maybe some scratches you missed, go back and finish that up before you apply more and more, more finish. Um, but no, it's a lovely light um, and resonant finish. Um, it doesn't crack or split like say uh, nitrocellulose wood. And then if it does get damaged, it's a lot easier to repair. Um, you just basically have to sand um, back a few layers and then reapply um, oil and wax until it's all sorted out. So I hope you found that all useful and I hope you can use this in your own projects. It's not a bulletproof finish, you could easily scratch and ding it, um, 
but my assumption is that when you pay a high price for an instrument you're going to be careful with it hopefully um, and like I said this finish is quite easily repaired so if there is ever a ding or a dent or whatever else it can be steamed out and then sanded back a little bit and then the finish reapplied so it's quite simple um, well yes uh, thanks for watching hope you like I said found it useful um, like and subscribe I'll try and put some more kind of how-to videos out in future this one took me a little long to get to um, after the last one um, just a lot more work to do with it really um, but I hope you enjoyed it um, if you have any questions or queries drop me a comment down below um, or check out the website for more information thanks very much I'll see you soon